I was really, really touched and impressed by this. We want to encourage you to see out of this meeting Heard today from the top of the society. We need 10,000 mesas de la negociación. At least half the people will be women. <laughs> the role of the media is going to be key. You saw in the story, the man heard on the radio. Little initiatives become very big initiatives. That so many examples, possible examples of creative use of the media. One, you know, you'd be half chavista, half, you know, uh, you're just, it's like, you check yes, no, undecided. It's to all of Venezuela, it's to the peace of Venezuela, it's to the children that could be empowered and spread through the society. Arm wrestling position with them, as if you're gonna get into an arm wrestle, a struggle. ¿Cómo pueden instituciones internacionales contribuir en un proceso como el que tiene Venezuela? ¿Fue posible que tanto el gobierno como la oposición nos invitaran a las instituciones a cumplir este rol que desde entonces eh, se planteó como un rol de, de facilitación? ¿Cómo se ha logrado evitar más violencia? Y, y francamente la única explicación que uno encuentra es el enorme respeto por la vida que hay en este país. Claro, no, se, no puede Venezuela dormir en los laureles, no puede pensar que los riesgos que se están tomando no sean elevados. Este problema hay que resolverlo, cuando digo hay que resolverlo, las partes tienen que llegar a acuerdos políticos. Si no es así, la recuperación de Venezuela va a ser un proceso muy largo, muy traumático, Por eso el, el trabajo que está realizando eh, William Uri en, 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 en Venezuela es tan importante, porque la sociedad civil ha jugado un papel protagónico importante a lo largo de estos meses, pero tiene un papel mucho más importante que jugar hoy en la búsqueda de la paz en Venezuela. Yo confío en que vamos a, finalmente a llegar a, a un acuerdo que le va a permitir a este país votar por los proyectos políticos que tiene a su consideración y encontrar una salida verdaderamente democrática al enfrentamiento que se vive en el país. Gracias. Buenos dias. To me, in this country, all the attention, the energy, the power has gone to those who are locked into conflict. And if we're going to create, if you're going to create a possibility for peace, it's going to be with the kind of energy that was just shaking this building. I also want to thank President Gaviria. I've been in many conflicts around the world, and I don't know of one where you have the Secretary General of an organization that has 34 members, the Organization of American States, and where the Secretary General says, here's one place, Venezuela which needs my help to help convene parties to pursue a peaceful path and stays here day after day, week after week, month after month. And to me, that's, that's a tribute to him and that's a tribute to you, the people of Venezuela, that, that he believes, he really believes in the possibility that there will be a peaceful, solution to this to this difficult conflict the first time i was here was in march just before the very difficult days of april then i came back in october 
at the invitation of the Carter Center. And I saw both how difficult the situation was here and what an enormous opportunity the people of Venezuela have here that's rare. I've worked in so many different situations in Africa, in Asia, in Indonesia, in Yugoslavia, in the Middle East. And almost always, I'm working in a situation where the blood has flowed. And thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people have been killed, raped, refugees. And here, there's actually an opportunity to prevent, to prevent, to catch it before it happens. In this world, we're very good at building a $50 million hospital at the bottom of a cliff. What we're not so good at is building a $50 fence at the top of the cliff. It's so much more costly in human life, in energy, in lost potential, in lost childhoods, to try to deal with conflicts after they've crossed that tipping point into massive bloodshed. And so there's an enormous opportunity here in Venezuela. And that's what I see. I see the danger. I see the danger. As I, over the last 25 years, as I've worked in the area of conflicts, social conflicts, and let me tell you, the, the conflict going on here in Venezuela is, is unique. And yet, the great majority of conflicts in the world today are conflicts that more resemble the conflict in Venezuela than they resemble this other conflict that is now consuming the attention of the world, which is the impending conflict with Iraq or with North Korea. And we're living in a difficult time in the world today. But the great majority of conflicts, more than 90% of the world's conflicts, are not international conflicts. They're internal conflicts. And as all of us who now have families, the more internal the conflict, those are the most difficult in some ways. The conflicts within the family, those are, those are really difficult, or within the organization. Those are, in some ways, more difficult than the, the, than the conflicts outside. And one of the things I've looked for is I've, to see what the potential is to prevent, is to look for what are the signals, what are the signs of potential danger? The signs that a conflict might escalate into the threshold of major violence. And my colleagues and I have been gathering these signs, and let me just share a few of them with you. One is when the population starts arming themselves out of fear. People start buying weapons, thinking, just in case, I better have that weapon. It's concerning. It's a real danger sign, one of the best danger signs. A second one is actions and verbal behavior that is extremely disrespectful to another human being. It might be verbal insults, it might be intimidation, physical intimidation, intimidation of the families of those people involved, the children in their schools, patients in hospitals. A third is the media, which plays an enormously important role in any society and can play an enormously destructive role in conflicts. When the media gets politicized, that's a sure signal that something very dangerous may occur. That's what happened in Yugoslavia. That's what happened in Rwanda. We saw the bloodshed, the hundreds of thousands of bodies. What started that? The media. Not, not, I'm not blaming the media. I'm not blaming the media. I'm not judging them. But in other words, it was through the use of the media that the hatred was radiated out to an entire country that allowed such barbarity to occur. So you have to be very concerned when the media starts to get politicized. 
Because then what happens is that people cease to trust the media as a credible source. And then what takes over in these conflicts is rumors. They're about to attack on this date. Wait, that will be the date. They're about to attack. Prepare your arms. Fear surges through the population. And then the situation is extremely vulnerable to a few isolated extreme acts of violence to trigger a whole cascade of violence. The other signal, interestingly enough, is not so visible. It's not a visible signal. It exists in our heads, in our minds. And Tony Robbins referred to it when he said the first step of leadership is to see it as it is. Because when things get difficult, human beings, every human being, every one of us, begins with denial. When we have bad news, any one of us, on an individual level, on a group level, we go through natural human phases, and the first one is denial. It's not happening. It cannot be happening. It will never happen here. And this is particularly acute in those societies which have enjoyed long periods of relative peace. It's just natural to feel like civil war, what's happening in Colombia, what's happening in, happened in Yugoslavia, no, it could never happen here. Well, the sad truth is we've just gone down a checklist of the danger signals that all these conflicts manifested before they tipped into civil war. So it can happen here. We have to begin by facing that reality because that's what's going to create the motivation for the entire population to mobilize for peace. And people realize that they look into a crystal ball and they can see that for the sake of the children, for the sake of everyone, for the sake of all Venezuela, certain actions can be taken now, which can prevent that possibility. I don't believe that Venezuela is going to go into civil war. I really believe that Venezuela is going to be able to prevent this. At the same time, we need to kind of look that menace, that peril, in the eye. And the other thing I might just mention about war is our images of war from the past are often kind of informed by heroic images and so on. Uh, one side wins, the other side loses. I've yet to see one situation, not one conflict, where one side won. What happens is when they go to war, both sides lose. And the people who lose most are the surrounding community, the young, the elderly, the women, the people who are most vulnerable. One statistic. A hundred years ago, in war, out of ten people who died in war, nine were soldiers. One was a civilian. In today's wars, that ratio is exactly reversed. Out of ten victims of war, one is a soldier, nine are civilians. They're children, they're women, they're elderly people. That is the modern face of war. That's the modern face of conflict. And that's why it's no longer possible for us to say, well, let them fight, let them fight, it won't affect me. It doesn't work. It affects everybody these days. I was working in Northern Ireland. They have a saying in Northern Ireland. They say, is this a private fight? Or can anyone get in? Is this a private fight or can anyone get in? And the truth is, in this world, there are no more private fights. Any fight that takes place in Venezuela affects all Venezuelans. Not only all Venezuelans, the world, humanity. And I think Venezuela here 
has a chance to lead the way, to actually show the world, to show the world that you don't have to go to war. You can actually catch the situation before it escalates. You can prevent. And one reason why I'm hopeful was alluded to by President Gaviria in his speech. The amazing thing here that has astonished international observers and people who know a lot of war situations like, my, like myself, who've experienced them, the amazing thing is that there hasn't been more violence than there has been. There has been violence, it's been terrible. Any single incident of violence is unacceptable. And at the same time, the level hasn't been nearly what international observers would have expected. I mean, where in the world could you have in this great city, in a protest demonstration, on one side of a very emotional conflict, they meet, the young men start to play football. I saw, I was in Brazil, and I saw the image there on, in the Brazilian papers. And uh, that kind of self-restraint is highly unusual. I don't think that would happen in my country. I don't think my own countrymen are capable of that kind of self-restraint. And it goes back to that simple respect for life that President Gaviria talked about. And that respect for life is just another name for what we call the third side. The third side for me, it's the surrounding community. There are the two sides in the conflict and there's the third side, which is the surrounding community. And it's like, if I may use a, a kind of an analogy to the human body, you know, all of us, for example, right now in the room are carrying viruses. But almost none of us, very few of us, are manifesting that virus in the form of an illness. Why not? Because our immune system is holding that virus in check. The same thing is true with the social body, the social body, the community. Violence, as we've discovered, is like a virus. Once it starts, it spreads. It spreads from one side, there's one violent incident, it provokes another violent incident. It spreads like wildfire. What holds it in check is something that we haven't given a name to thus far. It's a kind of social immune system. And I give it the name of the third side. And to me, the third side is not a new idea. I'm not bringing any new ideas here. The third side exists right here in the room. It exists right here in this country. And to my way of seeing and thinking, it's the third side in Venezuela, that social immune system that is responsible for the fact that there's been comparatively little violence thus far in this situation compared to what observers might have expected. It's because the body, the, the civic culture here, the respect for life, is strong enough to hold the virus of violence in check in the midst of raging emotions, lots of anger, lots of fear. And so, to me, the task for us is the conflict is escalating still. It's sad for me to come back uh, after seeing in October to see that the conflict has es taken another escalatory turn. And so the challenge facing all of us is how do we strengthen? How do we give more strength to the third side so that it can be strong enough to contain the conflict so that the conflict can be handled peaceably rather than destructively. We talk about conflict as if it's something bad. The truth is that conflict is part of life. Any change, any social change requires conflict. But the choice really is, are we going to handle that conflict in a destructive way, through disrespect, through violence, through intimidation, 
Or are we going to handle the conflict through constructive means, like dialogue, like negotiation, like democracy, which is, after all, an organized system of conflict. It's a democracy. Conflict is at the root of democracy. It assumes there are going to be conflict. So that's the question here. We don't have to end the conflict. That's the good news, because ending the conflict would be perhaps an unrealistic objective. All you need to do here is transform the conflict. In other words, change the form of the conflict from destruction to constructive conflict, to healthy conflict. I just want to talk a little bit about the third side for a moment. And maybe the best way is to give some examples of it in other countries. And then, because I think the third side is very strong here, and there must be many, many examples of the third side at work. One of the first times that I realized the importance of the third side, when I was, I was looking at all these conflicts in the world that are so difficult, how do you, what does it take to resolve them? It's not just dropping in a mediator you know, and finding a solution. It's a, it takes a much, much more. And the first clue for me came when I was in South Africa doing some work with the parties back in the late 1980s, at a time when everyone in the world thought South Africa was a complete mess. There was no possibility for South Africa. There was no solution. There was, it was just going to be war, civil war, for as long as anyone could foresee. They said, no, actually, there is a third side. And it's the larger community. I you know, would have thought, just like many of us watching the media, that the peace was made by Nelson Mandela and Frederick de Klerk. Great leadership. They were enormously, particularly Mandela, an enormously a giant of a man. But that wasn't enough, because even if they made an agreement, there was so much political violence in that society, so many marches and demonstrations and riots, that it was, it, destroyed, it was destroying the process, and processes are very, very vulnerable. The same thing could happen here. You could have an electoral accord at the Mesa de la Negociación and have an election, but if there's political violence and intimidation and fraud, if there isn't the, an atmosphere, you won't have free and fair elections, and the loser will not accept the results, and the results may be worse, more violence. What I saw, what, the, what was needed, and what was provided in the South African experience, was that at some point, the members of the civil society, the citizens themselves, starting with the women, and women are an extremely important force in making peace. Men are sometimes better at making war. Women are made <laughs> and. Uh, It started with the women, it started with the women and the churches, the religious people. They got together, the business community, the labor unions, the university students, the young people. They all got together and with the blessing of the government and the opposition, but not with the active participation, it was the civil society they formed something which they called the National Peace Accord. They all, all the people came and they signed up to a set of principles against violence. No matter what side you're on, I'm against violence. I'm for peace. I'm for democracy. I'm for dialogue. And they formed peace committees at every level of the society. There was a national peace committee where there were blacks and whites, poor and rich, small shopkeepers or vendors with big entrepreneurs, people from all walks of life sitting around a table, a mesa de negociación. And then in every part of the society, every province had one, every district had one, every town, every barrio had a peace committee. They formed them. And their job was first, dialogue, understand the other, listen. Don't try to convert the other, just understand them. 
But then more importantly, they took it beyond dialogue and they said, what can we do to act? Action is needed to create, to, to reduce and prevent the political violence that is preventing a peaceful transformation of the conflict. And so they worked with the local police, they worked with each other to make sure when there was a march or a demonstration that, uh, that there wasn't violence. Each side worked with each other, they worked with their own sides. When rumors started to fly that the other side was about to attack, what did they do? They checked out the rumor with the other members of the Peace Committee and said, is that true? Are you about to attack? They then report back to their own people. They kept things calm. And they began to begin the very slow process of reconciliation as well. And they participated to make sure to create the conditions for free and fair elections, which then transformed the society. So the critical ingredient there wasn't just the negotiations at the top, it was the involvement of the entire society, the mobilization of the entire society. That's the third side at work. I've seen the same process happen in Northern Ireland. People said, Catholics and Protestants, they'll be fighting for centuries. What happened again? It started with the women. The women started marching in the streets, Catholic women and Protestant women together. Because they're, it, it's harder to attack the mothers and the sisters, particularly they've lost their fathers or their children in, 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 in the violence. And they started speaking up. And then soon thereafter, the religious leaders started speaking up and had the courage to speak up. And to be a third sider takes some courage. And then the business community said, well, you know, this conflict is terrible for business. It's ruining our economy. And they started to participate. And then the politicians. And everyone starts to get engaged. And that's what turns those situations around. That's what turns around situations that people think are impossible. And I know that there's often a lot of despair in the midst of conflicts like this one. The third side, if I could put on a little more of a academic hat, what's the third side? The third side is the community mobilized systematically to transform conflict. It's three things. It's a perspective, it's a change in perspective, it's a change, it's a, it's a voice, it's a will to act, and the third thing is it's a whole series of roles that each of us can play. Let me take each one of those in turn for a moment. It's a change in perspective. Let me ask you, many of you may have seen this picture before. How old do you see the woman here in this picture? How many of you see a woman who's 20? How many is 30? Okay, a few hands. 40. Okay, a few more hands. 50. 60. Quite a few hands. Setenta. Lots of hands. Ochenta. Lots more hands. Noventa. Few hands. Same. Okay. If this picture was designed by psychologists many years ago to study human perception. In effect, there's one picture, there's one reality. But in fact, there are many ways of seeing that same reality. Everyone in the room here is right. The people who say she's 20 are right, 30, 40, all the way up to 90 and 100. You're all right. The people who are seeing her as young, they're seeing a woman in profile. This is her eyelash. That's her nose. Menton. Oreja. Can everyone see that picture? Okay, now, the older woman that people are seeing is nariz, ojo, boca, menton. Oh, there's a few of you who cannot see it. You're doing us a favor, you see? We're illustrating something about the way the human mind works, which is once you see the picture one way, sometimes it's very difficult to see the picture in any other way. You right now, in this very moment, have a third side perspective. You can see both sides of this picture. This is the same third side perspective we need in every conflict, whether it's a family conflict or whether it's a conflict between here 
society-wide in this country. The ability to understand and see both pictures of reality. If, if people try to win the conflict, they will end up all losing. The only way it's going to work is through a negotiation in which the key, the most key skill in negotiation that we need at all levels is the ability to put ourselves in the shoes of the other, to see the world the way they see it. Because we're trying, we'd like them to change their minds. How can you possibly ask someone to change their mind? How can you help someone change their mind if you don't know where their mind is? Almost impossible. And so the key skill, which is what you've got here, is a third side perspective, is the ability to see it from one point of view and then to flip and see it from the other point of view. And, you know, there's a resistance to doing this, and I'm sure you'll find it when you apply it to a real conflict. For me, it was highlighted once when I was making this point to a group of generals, American generals. We were talking about how to negotiate with the Soviet Union. And I was making this point. You want to negotiate with the Soviet Union? You have to put yourself in their shoes, understand the way they see the world. And one general with lots of medals got up and said, what? You're asking me to put myself in the shoes of the Soviets? That might distort my judgment. And I think he expressed the fear that we all have. If I put myself in the shoes of the other, that's going to distort my judgment. But no, the third side perspective is without abandoning the way you see the situation, you may have sympathies one way. At least you can put yourself in the shoes of the other side and understand the way they see it without abandoning yours. And even better, see it from both sides perspective. And that's right now you have a third side perspective. That's, that's what's present here in the room. And that's what we need to take back into the society at large. Now the third side, in addition to being a perspective, it's a voice. In South Africa, it was a voice. And it was a voice that said no to violence. No to violence. It basically said basta. People need to stop for a moment. Come to their senses. Think about what they're doing. Think about how they're destroying the community, the whole country. Think about the young people, what their future is going to be. People need to stop because they get into these into these patterns, repetitive patterns of reaction against the other. So much anger and so much fear. Someone needs to say stop. Uh, they were playing the role first of saying basta, being the interrupter, being the witness, the testigo, and, being, and saying no, the, the interrupter of the pattern. These are, the, these are ten of the roles of the third side. And there are three, they fall into three categories. The first is when a conflict is very serious at the, the highest level, like it is here, the roles of containment are very important. The ability to witness, to be there, to be present. You know, human behavior changes when there are witnesses. Even if the witnesses say nothing sometimes, there's just enough people around the violent, and, the, and, and with an intention that violence not take place, the violence doesn't take place. The media play actually could play a very constructive role here. I've watched in many situations around the world where the camera goes, the violence stops uh, in, in a, lot of, a lot of very bloody conflicts because people don't want to be perceived, shown as uh, being violent on the camera. There's the role of the healer, very important. The role of... Uh, the role of forgiveness, the role of apology. Guadal, they had a ceremony there. They had a ceremony for the peace of Venezuela. And the shamans, the shaman there, they blessed this, this necklace to have it transmit a feeling of peace. That is the role of the healer. Think for a moment of those people. There's one corner. Yes, please. Yeah. We may not think of it as a third, as a third side, but the people who work for social justice, 
the people who work to meet the basic human needs of all Venezuelans, they are third-siders because they're dealing with the root conditions that often trigger social conflict. Those of you who teach, and many of you who can teach your children or those around you skills of how to communicate, how to show respect, how to negotiate, how to listen, those are all third-siders. Those of you who build bridges between communities or individuals, you're all third-siders. Okay, would you mind standing up for just one second, all of you, who, who are committed there. So this is the third side right here. The third side is us. How many of you would be willing to seek out someone, perhaps from the other side of the conflict, and say hello to them? Here, right now in the break. Okay. That's bridge building, and that's, that's the first step, and that's what's needed. So I would encourage you, use the break. See if you can be a bridge builder. Let me, uh, if I may, uh, conduct a one-minute experiment with you. If you will turn to the person next to you, and if you will get into arm wrestling position with them, a struggle, okay? So we're going to represent the conflict for a moment. Is every time you get the other person's arm down, you get, let's say, a thousand points. Listos? Begin. <laughs> so I'm seeing something very, very interesting in this experiment here. There's a lesson in this because we approach conflict very much like an arm wrestling contest. The secret of negotiation, the secret is to change the rules of the game, to change the game from an arm wrestling to an exercise in mutual cooperation, in negotiation, in dialogue, looking for solutions so that both sides can have their basic interests met. And that's the only way this problem is going to be resolved peacefully. The alternative is war. And the, and the other alternative of cooperating is so much more attractive and so much more beneficial and so much more beneficial not only for both parties, but for the entire Venezuelan community. That's the role of the third side, is to change the game. Tengo el honor de presentarles al señor Anthony Robbins. Él es un especialista de alto nivel en liderazgo y motivación. Él ha sido llamado en consulta muchas veces por distintos líderes mundiales como el presidente Clinton, Reagan, la madre Teresa, el presidente Gorbachev. Leaders basically have a mandate to do three things if they're going to create change. And leaders are a source of change and there are leaders filled with this room. The first thing they must do is see things as they really are and not be in denial. Lying to ourselves is the greatest way to guarantee no progress. And we all know this and we all lie to ourselves at times. We call it rationalization. The changes happen in your life when you can do step two, and this is the job of leadership, and that is you must see it better than it is. Uh, we've met with both sides many times over the last few days, um, and we've heard all the points that they share, all the grievances, all the upsets, all of the emotion, all of the legitimate concerns that both sides have. But the only progress happens is when we can not stay with where we were, but to move into what we're going after. You cannot drive into the future using a rear-view mirror, because if you do, you will crash. And so much of the negotiation is looking in the rear-view mirror of what has happened up until even five minutes ago. The only progress can happen is when we look ahead and we create a vision together. And things that seem impossible are only possible when we as leaders create a vision that we commit to that is larger than our upsets of the past. So step one, see it as it is. Step two, see it better than it is. And step three is now find the strategies, the will, the daily commitment to do the little things that will make that vision real. Number one, women. In every, one, every of the societies I've observed, or many of them, I would say, as I mentioned this morning, women play a leading role. Women often, they have... The, they prize connection, they have relationships, and they are also, it's one thing, that they're, they're talented at building bridges. They are also people who feel the pain, maybe even more deeply, uh, because it's their children who are, who, who are at risk 
in these conflicts? Is there children who are going to die or suffer? And then the third thing that makes women, I think, really important is that they're harder to attack. As you all know, as third-siders, when you step out and people say, which side are you on? You say, I'm the third side. You might be accused by some or thought of some as being a traitor, of abandoning someone or betraying your side. The women go first. They open the permission. In South Africa, this happened. In uh, Northern Ireland, it happened. In Israel and Palestine, you know, we don't see so much of it on TV, but there are groups of Israeli and Palestinian women that work together, that go and visit the homes of everyone who has uh, lost someone in a terrorist attack or, a, or an attack by armed force. Women, actually also, naturally, have a special skill, special aptitude for listening. In Turkey, there's been a terrible civil conflict going on for many, many years. Thousands of people have been killed. Hundreds of villages destroyed. A group of Turkish leaders and a group of Kurdish leaders got together for a dialogue and they asked me to facilitate the dialogue. They couldn't hold the dialogue in Turkey because everyone was afraid they'd be assassinated if they were known to even be talking with the other side. That's how tense the situation is. So we met at a chateau outside of Paris in a secure location. And when they walked in, there were five on each side. One of the Tur Turkish leaders told me about another Turkish leader, he said, who was a real extreme youth leader, um, who had been an extreme youth leader in his youth, used violence, was a member of an organization called the White Wolves, which is a very violent student terrorist organization, really. And he said about this man, he said, I'm surprised he's here because this man would just as soon shoot a Kurd as talk with a Kurd. And then we went through the first, we went through the first day. We did even that same old lady, young lady exercise, but what happened was I had them listen to each other, just for the first time. This Turkish nationalist had never heard, he'd never listened. And, and here, here, here's a practical tool. What I asked him to do, I asked every one of them to do, is I asked them to divide into pairs, and I asked, say, the Kurdish participant to talk for one minute about what the Kurds really wanted. And then the Turkish participant, instead of answering, their job before they could answer was to repeat back to the Kurdish participant exactly what the Kurdish participant had said to the satisfaction of the Kurdish participant. And only when he had done that could he then say what he wanted to say. Well, in fact, you know, this is a, an exercise that goes back at least as far as uh, the 11th century at the Catholic University in Paris, where in theological debates they had the same practical rule. You cannot respond to the other side until you have repeated back what the other side has said to the satisfaction of the other side. The third side is not something that goes and points fingers and says, you're the violent ones, you're the bad ones. Because in truth, in a deeper sense, the violence exists in each one of us. Which is what he was trying to say with that quote from Solzhenitsyn. And uh, so there is violence in every single death, every single indignity, every single act of disrespect is one too many. Because it's unnecessary, that's the thing. It's, it's human, you know, once I had a talk with, a, with an indigenous group in Malaysia, with one elder, and they don't have war. These people are known as the most pacific people on earth, the most peaceful people on earth. They don't murder each other, they don't have war. I said, so what's your secret? And he, he was kind of amazed that I even asked him this question. He said, well, you know, disease we can't control. You know, so if someone dies, he said, but fighting is made by man. Fighting can be controlled by men. It was that simple. And you're in the position to learn here from the mistakes of others. You can see how it's happened in different parts of the world. For example, I've been working in the Middle East. And for me, both parties have already discovered the solution. I mean, the problem is solved. They know, in fact, both parties know, if you talk to the officials on both sides, there's going to be a Jewish state and a Palestinian state. They even know where the borders are. They, they, they know everything. The only question is, how many more people are going to have to die until they, until they come to that agreement? 
In Northern Ireland, it used to be that when a bomb went off in a Catholic district, the Catholics would mourn. The Protestants would, some Protestants might celebrate, some Protestants, you know, would mostly remain silent. When a bomb went off in a Protestant district, the opposite would happen. But now, this is the turning point. This was the work of the third side. When a bomb goes off, it doesn't matter who the victim is, whether they're Catholic or Protestant. Both sides mourn. You immediately see Catholic priests, Protestant ministers, go straight to the place. Catholic politicians, Protestant politicians. The whole nation mourns everyone. Both sides in this fight, they will learn that no, neither will win. It's, it's inevitable. It's just a question of whether it's today, next month, next year, two years from now, but they will learn. Both sides will learn. Look at, you know, your neighbors in Colombia. Who's won that war? 30, 40 years they've been thinking, each side thinking they're going to win that war. You can see. Uh, it doesn't go anywhere. And now's the time to prevent because it makes it harder to learn when massive blood starts flowing. One of the major jobs of the third side is to help Venezuelans learn this lesson come to their senses. It's basta. Let's stop for a moment. Let's think. Let's think about what's important here. How are we going to create a better Venezuela for everybody here? I mean, take South Africa, for example. Neither side for years could see that there was anything that united them. What was going to unite? Blacks and whites were rich and poor. I mean, it was the most segregated then the whole society was separated. Nothing united them, and everything divided them. And there's, that's why it seems so impossible. And interestingly, I talked with uh, the chief negotiator for the, for the black population for the African National Congress, who was a man named by the name of Cyril Ramaphosa, and the chief negotiator for the white nationalist parties. And, I, you know, and they talked about what happened. And what was interesting was that they didn't see anything that united them. They got that less, you know, it took them a while, but Nelson Mandela writes about this in his memoirs. He finally realized that he, he wasn't going to win anything worth winning. They could continue their violence, their guerrilla attacks, and so on, but, you know, they weren't going to win, and if they did win, what, 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 the South Africa would be entirely destroyed. What kind of victory would that be, a hollow victory? And Frederick de Clare talked about how, you know, Sure, they could hold out for a while, but they weren't going to win in the long run either. But, so they both got the lesson. The first stage was they both got the lesson that neither could actually win, that you know, both sides would lose. What they, what the, but what was interesting was that they told me what they didn't appreciate until they got into the negotiation and the dialogue process was that there was a possibility that both sides could benefit, that there could be an agreement that would benefit both sides. Blacks and whites make a better South Africa for both peoples. They didn't appreciate that until they began the process of dialogue. And what united them, they found, was obviously a peaceful South Africa, but a prosperous South Africa that was capable of feeding its entire population and meeting the basic needs, dealing with social injustice, and a South Africa that was able to, to compete with, in terms of its economy with other economies in the global economy. A South Africa that was able to hold its own. And they found a whole variety of things that actually united them. And the amazing thing to me was talking to the white business community. The white business community that you know, wouldn't see that they had anything in common. They were the most enthusiastic proponents of the peaceful change. People who were very conservative, but they saw hey, this is the way that, you know, they could see the benefit of, you know, a South Africa. There was a vision that both sides could buy into. And the same thing is possible here. The great majority of Venezuelans want peace. They want an end to the violence. Violence is perpetrated by a small minority. And if it's supported by larger groups, it's only out of fear. It's only out of fear. But basically what people want is they want a good life for their children. They want a good life, you know, people want the same things in life.
The third side has to be, in Tony's words, very resourceful, very creative. So we're going to tap into creativity here. And the single biggest block to creativity is a little voice in the back of our heads that's always saying, that won't work. Third side, that won't work. Uh, you know, uh, that won't work. You know, you're at a group with a group of friends. You go back from this meeting. You go back and you tell your friends, you said, oh, we're going to do this, or we're going to do that. And they'll say, are you joking? Who do you think you are? You know, are you serious? You know, uh, you're local, you know, you know. You know, just, just relax, you know. You can't do anything. You can't change this. You know, you hear all those things. All those phrases are what might be called killer phrases. Because what they're killing off is the power of human creativity. The power of human imagination. And that's what drives the world. I am confident that the third side, which is already strong in this country and which has already resisted much violence, you will strengthen it and I will be able to come back here and see a Venezuela that's healing, that's healing, and that has prevented a major civil war. And that will be a model for the world. That will be a model for the world, not just for Venezuela. So that is my hope. I have a little daughter who's half Latina, she's mother's Brazilian, she's half gringa, she's four and a half, her name is Gabriela, and when I think about her, I think of all the little Venezuelan children. It's their fate, those five-year-olds right now, you're deciding their fate, what their future, what kind of Venezuela they're going to inherit. And I think, you know, for all those children, for all the children of the world, like the children that uh, Ludmila was talking about, the children in the Orinoco Delta, that's the third side is the voice of the future. It's the voice of the children. And so for the children, I really, really want this peace to come. So I wish you with all my heart all the best in creating a third side. And if I can be of any service, I hope you'll let me know. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Both sides in this fight, they will learn that no leader will win. It's, it's inevitable. It's just a question of whether it's today, next month, next year, two years from now, but they will learn. Hay que estar preparados para el momento en que las partes se den circunstancias que lleven a las partes a encontrar un acuerdo. Today is the preparation for the unity that will be. There will be votes. It's only a matter of when. But if votes happen tomorrow and we're not prepared for peace, the vote can occur and people can still not respect it. Out of ten victims of war, one is a soldier, nine are civilians. The big power is the third side. Because your own statistics and your own polls show that 41% of the people are not one extreme or the other. That means that group of people is more than either the other sides are. You are the largest side, but if you don't speak, you're the smallest side. One of the major jobs of the third side is to help Venezuelans learn this lesson, come to their senses. It's basta. Let's stop for a moment. Let's think. Let's think about what's important here. How are we going to create a better Venezuela for everybody here? What is the new vision? We can't go back. Trying to go back, you can forget. You will never go back to that. The new vision has to be how? How do we approach the human needs here? How do we make sure that the needs of the business owners that have earned the right to have their businesses have their rights, and the people that are poor share more in the wealth of the country? People always think it's the incident or the person. It never is. It's the fact that needs are not being met, and then that situation becomes the excuse to focus on so we don't have to change anything. We have something to be against and something to be for. You need a vision for what you're for. If you wouldn't mind just writing down one thing, one thing that you plan to do in the next week that you commit to doing,
that may be as simple as starting up a conversation with the person from the other side of the conflict. Maybe it's your father, maybe it's your mother, maybe it's your, you know, someone in the family, or maybe it's someone else, or maybe it's having lunch with someone and just saying, I'm going to have lunch with them and I'm going to listen. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to listen. I'm not going to argue with them. I'm going to listen to them. I'm going to give some value to what they're saying. Whatever it is, I'll find something that they're for social justice or they're for democracy. I'll find something that we have in common. Think about one thing you could do. Maybe it's start an organization. Maybe it's join something. But think of one thing you could do and just write it down right now. Something you are prepared to do. It could be small or it could be ambitious. Just write it down right now if you would. Just write it down and, and let us know that you do it. Communicate with us, uh, and I hope to receive many of these things, and I, I will be in touch.